that I'm going to talk to you about um, you know, Li-Fi at the other end of the spectrum, if I can say that. So, and that is um, Li-Fi for the consumer and how we see that happening. So, start out with uh, kind of the very big picture of the spectrum crunch. And you've heard many people today talk about um, how, uh, how RF and in particular Wi-Fi just can't handle, can't scale for the amount of data that uh, will be, the amount of data capacity that will be needed, you know, not, is needed already and be needed in the, in the near future. And also you've heard people talking about uh, some of the benefits of Li-Fi beyond that, uh, such as security and privacy. And I think you'll find, or hopefully you'll agree after the presentation, that um, the same uh, elements of the proposition that make Li-Fi attractive for defense or industry or office, uh, you know, are the ones that also make Li-Fi attractive for consumer use in the home or Soho or that sort of thing. It's just um, which one is more important or less important for the particular, I don't, don't want to say use case because I'll come back to use cases, but um, the particular scenario or environment that it's being used in. So let's just look at, again at the very big picture. So in 2021, globally, we all consumed 72 exabytes of data per month you know, to kind of give a way of um, comprehending what an exabyte is or how much an exabyte is. If one were the size of the earth, or sorry, if one um, gigabyte were the size of the earth, then an exabyte would be the size of the sun. And we used 72 of those or did in 2021 um, every month. And it's growing very rapidly. Mobile data traffic grew 44%, uh, you know, just in a year, and a lot driven by lockdowns and um, everything else, all the fallout from the pandemic. And Wi-Fi is falling short. So a lot of the, a lot of what you hear about the spectrum crunch is at the, um, you know, the, the macro level. So that makes it really kind of hard to get your head around sometimes. But the spectrum crunch also happens at the micro level in your home. So every time your daughter asks you to get off a video conference because her game is uh, glitching, you know, that's the spectrum crunch happening in your house. So you know, just some statistics there. 40% increase during the pandemic time in connected devices in homes in the United States a 62% increase in overall data consumption, powered a lot by increase in video streaming, 40% that you see there, and um, upload as people were, you know, having more video conferences at home, doing more things like that, you know, upload increasing dramatically up 116%. And at the same time that all that's increasing, and, and in large part because all that's increasing, the experience day to day is getting worse. So. 20% increase in buffering reported, 19% increase in video start failures. So that's when you try to play a movie on Netflix and it doesn't start, it pops up that error message. And 100% um, increase in what they call bad link minutes. So um, that's uh, you know time that your activity, whatever it is, is simply not working because you can't get a connection. And although a lot of this, uh, or you know these big increases, happened during the, uh, the, during lockdowns, during pandemic time, the decline in experience is continuing and it, it's only going to get worse. So taking the example of augmented reality and, and virtual reality, all the hype around the metaverse right now, um, you know, it, the uh, bandwidth requirements, the low latency requirements, the jitter requirements for those sorts of applications are much higher than what they are for something like uh, video streaming or, or video conferencing. And, you know, Cisco's saying that traffic will increase um, five times for AR and VR between 2019 and, um, and this year. So we'll see if they were right. And, you know, generally lots of figures there, but use of AR and VR, especially as we move into the metaverse, you know, will, uh, will very much increase. So how big does the pipe need to be? Well, you know, whether it's memory or, um, 
you know, the bandwidth, network bandwidth in the past, the rule is that the need expands to fill what's available. So um, you would have heard uh, Harold Haas this morning talk about uh, their experiments where, they, where they've achieved a terabit per second or demonstrated that a terabit per second is possible using Wi-Fi. Well, um, you know, what, what's something that you can do with that? You might think, who will ever use that? Well, to um, accurately depict gestures and expressions in a 3D hologram of a human face, so think metaverse sometime in the future, then you, that's 19 gigapixels required for each frame and that works out to one terabit per second that's needed in order to do that. So if we look at uh, you know, what, what the picture looks like on Wi-Fi, you know, it started out great when you were the only person in your neighborhood with a 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi connection. Same thing when you were the only person and it was just maybe your smartphone and your laptop that were on five gigahertz in your house. But as more and more devices come on, more and more um, people get uh, on that network or on that frequency, then the overall experience gets worse. There's um, interference, contention. Um, and uh, thinking back to the big increase in connected devices in the house, a lot of IoT devices today are at 2.4 gigahertz, so you may not really see a big impact if you're at five gigahertz in your house. But um, you know, Espressif, which is the chipset supplier for um, probably a majority of the Wi-Fi connected smart home IoT products out there, um, recently announced a Wi-Fi 6 chipset uh, moving from just 2.4, which is what they have today. So all those connected devices being added to home, you know, they'll now be there on five gigahertz too. And Wi-Fi, as you've heard lots of people say today, huge spectrum availability. Um, every user gets full bandwidth, so if you're under an access point uh, um, over here and I'm under an access point over there, probably should have done the other, other way around, then um, you know, we each get full bandwidth available. And the um, rather than the wireless link being the um, barrier to, uh, to uh, high speeds, then it becomes the backhaul, which is the barrier and eventually the broadband connection. And also, you know, Wi-Fi is simply not secure. Um, IoT devices, the very first time they connect to the network are attacked within five minutes um, on average. And um, a lot of those attacks, of course, are uh, over the internet. They're not, um, they're not ones that would be helped with Wi-Fi versus Wi-Fi, but more and more, they are ones that would be helped. So ones that depend on physical proximity. So you know, me in a car outside your house getting onto your Wi-Fi network, or you know, just to give an, an extreme example, there was recently a case in the UK where um, a couple had someone hack into their Wi-Fi network for the purposes of using their um, Wi-Fi network for a, some abhorrent um, criminal activity. And uh, they, the police ended up bringing charges against that couple because it was their Wi-Fi network. They had all of their devices confiscated. They weren't allowed to collect their children from school for a year because of the nature of the criminal activity. And you know, that's, it's an extreme example, but it just goes to show physical proximity networks are real and they're increasing. It's really the new frontier in security. So Li-Fi is a solution. Speed and bandwidth, we've heard a lot about. We have a proof of concept um, optical front ends. We call them light antenna modules that are at one gigabit per second today and we're only going higher than that. Um, spectrum availability is there. Um, Alessandro had a great number. How many zeros was it? Point zero zero is zero to five percent of just visible light spectrum that's um, that was being used for that uh, wide bandwidth signal consistently low latency and jitter i'll show in a minute some uh, experiments that we've done around that interference free with high data density military grade security and you know that sounds like a marketing term but it's not uh, as i said we've got thousands of devices deployed with the u.s army 
and uh, it's free spectrum, unlike radio. It's not subject to licensing in any country. There's only one country, Singapore, that regulates it, but um, you don't actually have to do anything in order to use light spectrum. It's more theoretical regulation than, than uh, actual practical. And also near zero EM signature. So that's really important to the Army, you know, as, the, as we say, as they say too. If you can detect it, you can target it. So if you can see someone's RF activity, then you can fire a missile at it. Not so important, hopefully, for your house. But um, you know, these physical proximity attacks, it's important for that because uh, if I'm sitting outside your house and I can't see that you're using Li-Fi or I can't see your network, then um, you know, I don't even have a chance of getting on it. So uh, how much better is Li-Fi? Well, these are some really uh, simplistic experiments that we did. So uh, in a minute, I'll show a um, proof of concept smartphone that we have with, uh, with using Wi-Fi. And uh, we, using that same phone, um, same baseband, running 802.11 um, AC single channel, we um, did some tests with Wi-Fi, we did some tests with Wi-Fi, and as you can see, we had consistently higher throughput. Because it was single channel using our light antenna module, we didn't get up to the one gigabit per second, which is possible if we go for multiple channels, but uh, we were well up over 300 consistently, and you know, Wi-Fi is lower and it jumps all around. That's on, um, as I say, exactly the same baseband in the same phone. Uh, lower latency consistently and also lower jitter consistently. And it may seem like I'm, so I've spent most of this so far attacking Wi-Fi, but you know, as other speakers have said, um, it, it's important that Li-Fi interoperates with Wi-Fi. And um, it, you know, it does and it can. On that phone that I've got, or that I mentioned, when the signal is blocked because you put the phone in your pocket, then the phone switches over to, uh, to Wi-Fi and you can continue doing whatever you're doing. And especially you can do the lower bandwidth um, activities, which you know, don't need the wide bandwidth available from Wi-Fi. So how do we get to consumer? Well, first of all, there are lots of examples like GPS who've gone from purely military, purely defense applications to consumer applications. Um, but what we really need to do as an industry is to um, move from making just systems like we have with our kite fin descent systems or OLEDCOM and Signify have as well with some of their devices to making um, chips so that it's not just a few of us, but say the 500 startups that Alessandra mentioned or you know, thousands of other companies who can take our chips, take our components and make great Li-Fi uh, products out of them. So in order to get there with consumer Li-Fi, we need a compelling proposition. I've talked about and others have talked about some of that, security, high bandwidth, privacy, lack of interference, et cetera. Um, and so there needs to be a reason that people want to put Li-Fi in their products. It needs to be simple to integrate. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is the light antenna module, our optical front end that I mentioned. And you can see the size of it there, and uh, it can go into existing architectures. It needs to be affordable. A lot of that is about economies of scale as well as design. So um, you know, as we sell more and more Li-Fi, then it will, the prices will come down. It needs to be easy to de deploy, so to take access points. You shouldn't have to rip up your ceiling and lay Ethernet cable everywhere in order to, uh, to put them in. And we need some real use cases. So we think that 802.11bb in particular will open up the mass market. Um, as Mac, Max from um, Nokia said this morning, it's kind of, he said, quick and dirty. I'd like to you know, make it sound less dirty, but you know, certainly the quick way to get uh, Wi-Fi into products and have it interoperate with Wi-Fi. So in 2023, IDC says there'll be 5 billion devices that ship, that ship with uh, Wi-Fi chipsets, Wi-Fi basebands. And you know, in theory and you know, in fact in practice, if they wanted to do it, then all of those could work with Li-Fi as well. Um, you may have seen, I think Harold showed the kind of the timeline for standardization on 802.11bb. 
the um, stable draft is out now for moving toward ratification, and we expect um, early next year to have um, late, late this year, early next year, to have the standard and center compliant devices next year. So, um, what does it look like when you put Li-Fi in a phone? Well, so th this is uh, a proof of concept that we've done. Um, if you want to search pure Li-Fi on YouTube, you can see this in action, see some demos for it. Um, we've got um, a case which fits around a phone and makes simply a five gigahertz connection to the existing antenna terminal um, in the phone. It really is as simple as that. We drilled a hole into the back of the phone and put a wire connecting to the, uh, to the antenna connector. Um, and all of the Li-Fi smarts sits, um, sits in this case. This Android system is unaware even that it's there. It just looks like Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, it, you can see the access point change from, uh, from whatever your Wi-Fi access point is to Li-Fi and vice versa, depending on what you're doing. It's infrared, both for the uplink and downlink. Um, some of our systems, like uh, KiteFin for defense, use infrared for the uplink and visible light for the downlink. You know, Li-Fi can use um, any uh, part of the spectrum, as others have talked about. But this particular implementation is infrared for both, which means it works in the dark. You don't have a light shining in your face if, um, you know, for, for the uplink if it were on visible light. We get up to about 350 megabits per second on single channel 802.11ac, as I mentioned. You know, and you can roughly say with multi-channel, multiply that by two or four, or however many channels you have available. And it's straightforward to integrate into a commercial product. So although we drilled through the back of the phone, uh, you know, if we had access, when we have access to, um, you know, to the internal phones working with phone vendors, then the light antenna module and su supporting circuitry around it goes in there. And, you know, it fits in a um, high-end flagship phone um, today without making it big and bulky. So expanding beyond that, easy to deploy. We showed it Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in March, concept that we call Li-Fi at home. So we showed the smartphone there. We showed the smartphone um, working to, with a TV to, uh, to stream video content and, and screen mirroring to it. We had Li-Fi integrated with Microsoft HoloLens um, AR and VR headsets. And importantly, we showed an access point which we see as the vision for how you get it into your house. So this is an access point which provides visible light that's not used for communication, it's just light. And also um, Li-Fi in the same hole that you already have in your ceiling for your GU-10 downlighter. And we had that networked in the back hall with using power line, um, in fact, with max linear chips in it. Um, and, uh, but it's also possible you know, if, you, if you have the luxury of uh, PoE running all around your house, power over Ethernet running on, all around your house, you can use that instead of power line or for uh, an office environment, you could use um, Ethernet, uh, Ethernet or PoE. So uh, kind of end talking about use cases. Uh, so a quick my thing on my background, most of it's in mobile phones and smartphones. This is a presentation or a slide from a presentation that I did frighteningly 20 years ago in looking at what could be done with the bandwidth that's out there. And I think the point I want to make is we don't know what the use cases are that are going to win for Li-Fi. Our job is to provide a better pipe so that others can come along with the use cases. You know, it, um, mobile uh, or remote photos for insurance claim adjusters didn't turn out to be the, you know, the killer app for cameras and phones, or, and it didn't turn out to be you know, what um, really drove data usage. And we'll find the same thing. So just a few other fun examples. Um, back in 2004, I had uh, fingerprint um, sensor companies to me saying, coming to me saying, put it in your phone. We'd ask them, what's the use case? Um, the 
that led to a very awkward conversation where the um, business development person was telling me that the best use case was a secret folder on your phone that you could hide your SMSs that you're exchanging with your mistress from your wife in case your wife ever got to the phone. You know, that probably does get used today, but it, it's not the killer use case for fingerprint sensors. This was one of my products back in 1999. We had a, uh, we called it a smartphone add-on that snapped around one of our phones at Philips. And you know, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's smallest fax machine. Again, fax was not the killer app for smartphones. And finally, let's look at cameras. So in 1999, Kyocera came out with the first phone with a camera in it. They had what turned out to be a right, the right use case, or one of the right use cases, but at the wrong time. It was video calling, but it was two frames per second, and you were probably the only person that you knew with this phone, so it was essentially useless. Um, Sony Ericsson with uh, photo sharing over SMS on the um, T68i back in 2002. Um, that didn't take off for a number of reasons, and MMS was expensive. You could send a photo, but you couldn't see it well on the small, um, low-resolution, low-color depth display. And another one of my products back in 2003, um, we saw what was happening with digital cameras in terms of selfies. So we thought, how can we enable that? Well, we stuck a mirror on the back of the phone because there was only one camera available. And again, you know, that wasn't the, the time for that either for, for many different reasons. So finally, um, or almost finally, um, you know, who wins in all of this? And I think this is a cautionary tale, meant to be a cautionary tale for us, the pioneers in Li-Fi to not be trapped by what you know. So you know, don't get stuck in a box where you think it's underwater use cases or military use cases or industrial use cases or defense use cases um, because that's not where the, uh, the big opportunity is. The big opportunity is in those 5 billion devices that are shipping every year with Wi-Fi chipsets or in the 1.7 billion phones that are shipping every year. And you know, we, we see what happens to companies that get trapped by what, they're, what, what they know already, you know, looking at the smartphone market. None of the same top brands are the top brands today in smartphones. But if you look at uh, the component side, so who was making components at that time? Omnivision, Sony, they're some of the big providers of, uh, of cameras for phones today. So um, another one of my products that in 2001, Omnivision was supplying a camera for our, uh, our camera add-on for our phone. And you know, that's 2022, they're bringing out a 200 megapixel camera um, in a Motorola phone, I think it is, that's due to ship within the next few months. So finally, takeaways, we need to lean into the spectrum crunch and everything that comes along with that, interference, contention, et cetera. And we really need to emphasize that the spectrum crunch is micro as well as macro. macro. We need to build a better pipe. Um, we need to make it easy, easy to integrate, easy to deploy in your house. And then we let the market find the use cases. You know, we maybe, hopefully, are right about some of the use cases that we're promoting now, but chances are the majority of them, we're not right about them or you know, we've never even imagined what they're gonna be. But if we give the tools, give the pipe to, uh, to the world, then they'll find the use cases. So thanks, if there's any time, any questions?